So hi, I'm Doug Lyne, I'm Media Lecturer at Brighton University and this is me talking about animals and their representations in the media. So I know you're going to ask me some questions, so this isn't to use in the video, this is just to look at to remind yourself later. So I sent you <coughs> a load of videos last night at ridiculous o'clock thinking about your project. And some of them were, it's like, there's loads of really hippie, wi hippy dippy people talking about animals and shamanic this, that and the other, that it's really hard to take them seriously because they're just so clearly kind of mad hippies. But the information that they're using is really old. It's really been around for thousands and thousands of years. And I think it's only changed fairly recently that we've we've seen animals differently through the media. Before, 50, 60 years ago, our stories about animals or using animals as metaphors was through the oral tradition, through speaking. And then we've replaced the oral tradition of speaking and telling each of the stories with the media. So there's this thing about animals as metaphor are used in ancient shamanic traditions in all societies, more recently in Jungian analysis and on contemporary films and TVs. So why do we, why do, we do this? Uh, I sent you a, a link to Animal Farm. George Orwell, who wrote 1984, also wrote Animal Farm, which was a metaphor of the Russian Revolution, but set on a farm using animals. And he wrote that in like 1954 or something. It's really old. But in some ways, one of the first examples of using animals as a metaphor for something else. I think that's quite interesting. But why? Why do we need to do this? And why today, when we, you know, to be fair, we kind of lord it over animals as if we're the rulers of the planet. Whereas previously, before civilization, we lived like animals, with animals the same as the rest of nature but we've kind of elevated ourselves above it. But yet, actually, we seem to really be quite reliant on animals and nature. And also, we seem to use them a lot as something to look to as an example. But on the one hand, we think we're better than animals and more intelligent, and they're just animals. But then if you watch almost any nature programs or anything about animals, we seem to personify them with the way that we describe animals' behaviour is as if they're humans with some form of morality, family values. It's like we put our human stuff onto them. When I kind of what I was trying to get at with you with the shamanic stuff is if you go back 3,000 years, human beings looked to animals as the model of how to live in harmony with nature. Whether you go for any of the spiritual stuff or not is irrelevant, really. It was like nature is always in balance with itself. Our animals generally don't kill more than they need to eat, and everything kind of works itself out in a kind of harmonious way. Hello, seagull joining in there. So humans seem to compulsively humanize representations of animals in the media and we seem to see the natural world as a reflection of us and accord animal behaviors with morality and fairness and cruelty which are human things they're not animal things so i think there's something that's happened with animals in the media that is very recent and I think you've kind of beginning to get your finger on the pulse but we just don't quite know what the pulse is but maybe it'll come out the rest of your questions so have a go let's see what happens right. <clears throat> so um, what comes to mind when you think of sharks lions dogs and cats well okay so my name is Doug Lyon so I've grown up with the name Lion, which is really significant to me. I mean, I think, I think your name is really important. And I always really liked being Doug Lion. I think Lion is a very strong animal. It's, um, 
it's the top of the food chain as is a shark and it's held up as an example I mean it's strangely a symbol of Englishness but for a non-indigenous animal not really sure how that happened um, and I loved the Narnia stories so Aslan in the Narnia stories is a lion which is effectively Jesus it's a Christian again it's using animals as a metaphor for Jesus and the Christian story which when I was little and I read those stories I didn't really realise that but I, when I did later on I was like well I'm still okay with that I thought it was a really great story so for, for me as a the lion is very definitely something that it, it is my actual name, although it's L Y O N rather than L I O N. And then when I set up my Yahoo email in the olden days of early emails, I wanted Doug Lion at yahoo.co.uk and it wasn't available. So I thought, okay, so I was born in the year of the dragon in Chinese astrology. I'm a Piscean, which is a fish in uh, Western astrology, and my name is Lion. So I became Dragon Lionfish at yahoo.co.uk, became my email, which is three animals, one fictitious and one and two not. So actually, a long time ago now, this was like early 90s, I became Dragon Lionfish, but Lion was always there. And then when I started doing shamanic work, I changed it. So my medicine name became Dragon Lion Heart, which was something I was working with at the time. But the lion has always been very central to my given identity as a name and my chosen identity as a thing to work with. Shark. So I sent you a video <coughs> last night at Ridiculous O'Clock of a great white shark being attacked and eaten by a killer whale, right? I mean, how amazing is it that we live in a time when from the comfort of my own kitchen computer, I can see that? I mean, that's just incredible. It wasn't even a nature documentary. It was just somebody's camera thing. I mean, so, we have this thing about the shark as being the ultimate predator, obviously from Jaws, and the great white shark in particular. It's not. It's not the top of the chain. The killer whales can easily take it out because they are so fast. They just, they wait for the shark to be distracted by going for the seal and they just ram it. And it's, that's it, it's at it. And the, and the killer whales work as pods, they work as schools, whereas the great white sharks are kind of loner. So all those thoughts that we have in our heads about the way nature works, which comes from, a, you know, Jaws is a great film, but it's not really based on anything real about the way animals behave. And it caused a lot of problems for sharks on the planet, that film. But what is most amazing to me is like, how did somebody get to film that? How were they there when that happened? And then they bothered to put it up online and I can watch it in my kitchen. And then, the, I, I, I don't know why, I have this weird thing about which one will win kind of animal battles. A tiger and an alligator. Have you ever seen that? Which one do you think wins? The alligator? You'd think so, wouldn't you? Because they're like ancient dinosaur things with a, you know, suit of armour on. No, they've got no chance. Tigers just take them out. They just jump on them from behind, straight into the eyes, flip them, done. And it's like, wow, you know, like, I mean, nature is shocking when you really see what animals do with each other in, the, in survival. They're just surviving. I mean, that's all the animal kingdom is mostly, is like, who's eating who? It's a survival battle. And it's really brutal, but so kind of amazing to see, like, you can't be asleep if you're an animal you can't really hang out unless you really are definitely at the top of the food chain there's no hanging out you're just somebody else's lunch so that thing about the shark was really like 
they're not hanging out at the top of the food chain. A giant octopus and great white shark. Have you seen that? Octopus just takes it out. Tentacly things. Blah, 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 blah. So the shark's had it. It's not, it doesn't know what to bite. There's nothing to get hold of. There's, a, there's one in a tank. They, 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 kept, they had a shark tank. And the sharks kept disappearing. And they discovered it was the giant octopus at the bottom. was just going, thanks very much. I'll have another one of those. With its little beaky thing and it's whoa it's incredible so what i get from watching those uh, nature films is the the stories that we've got about animals are not very accurate from storytelling and from kind of some of the more um produced nature documentaries tell us a story they create a narrative around animals that is i don't think quite accurate because there's something about user generated content that is like a lot of it is rubbish isn't it a lot a lot of youtube stuff is rubbish but when you see something that is like somebody just happens to have been there with the camera caught something on film and bothered to bung it up online and it's not mediated in that way there's no story there, they've just chucked it up. It's like, oh, that's not the story that we've been told. I've seen other stuff around sharks as well, where most of the time you can hang out with them and swim about with them. If they're, if they're not really hungry or whatever, they're not, they're not man-eaters, they're not dangerous things, they're not predators in the way that we think they are. And now they're starting to make... Um, wetsuits that look like bumblebees with big yellow stripes and stuff across them because of course what we've now realised is you look like a seal in a black wetsuit and that's what they would normally eat so if you don't want to be eaten by a shark wear a big horrible day glow yellow stripey thing and they're not interested in you at all what were the other ones that you said? Um, it was dogs and cats alright so well, I love cats, and I really don't like dogs at all. So, that's the short version. The slightly longer version is, why don't I like dogs? I've got a second year group doing a thing about dogs, and I did a Why I Hate Dogs interview the other day. It's not really that I hate dogs, it's more that I hate the way that people keep dogs. I don't think most dogs are very well trained, they're mostly just annoying to me and their owners are as well through not training them properly. Cats tend to just do cat thing and you just chuck them out of the door and they sort themselves out and come back when they want feeding or a, a warm bed. But I think dogs for me symbolise something that's really wrong with human beings' relationship with animals is that we're very flippant about it, we don't take care of them properly, we don't train them properly we don't really look after them properly. I don't think people should be allowed to keep dogs. I, th I think it should be as hard to have a dog as it is to adopt a baby. You know, you like really prove that you're really bothered about it, not something you can just buy down the pet shop. So, yeah, a relationship with, I mean, you look at a farmer's relationship with a sheep dog, you can see they're a well-kept dog, they're beautifully trained, they're useful, they've got a great symbiotic relationship. Brilliant. That's you know, great, but 95% of dogs I see are just shitting everywhere, barking, shagging your leg, pissing on things, just annoying. It's probably not very useful. <laughs> um, well, I've got here that like shamanic theory says that it's the animals have a way of showing us um, how to be in touch with our spiritual self. Um, so, like, a dog would symbolise kindness, loyalty, and, um, yeah, if you come into contact with a dog, then you need to allow yourself to be gentle. Um, do you think this can be related with media representations of animals, like films of, um, like, homeward bound and stuff, with, like, cats and dogs, does that, do you think that could be related to the shamanic? <coughs> um, so, 
Well, it's complicated, this. Like, the shamanic thing, like I say, it's very ancient. And it goes back in nearly every society on the planet. If you go back before religion, which is like, if you go back to 3,000 years before religion became established, everything looked a lot more similar. So it doesn't matter whether you're looking at Eskimos or Aborigines or pagans in this country or Native Americans. Like, you go back far enough, then people lived on the land, they lived very closely with animals, they kind of lived more like animals. And th there is an argument to say that there's a theory now that's called the big lie, that is that human history didn't start two or three thousand years ago when we started to be agrarian and kind of started farms and planting food and kind of getting into the sort of cycle of living around where we were growing food and bringing things back and villages and towns, that there was a time before that for potentially a couple of billion years when human beings pretty much lived like animals, went out and got stuff, brought it back, but lived in, you know, ones or twos or small family groups. So, I don't know if that's true or not. I guess it's quite a difficult thing to prove. But my guess is that there was definitely a time before we were civilised, where we lived more like animals and, you know, Whatever the media is, this thing that we're doing now is media, but so was drawing on the cave walls. You know, it's like we've always done something with representations. It seems like human beings, ever since they've been around, have wanted to draw things on the wall or work with this. How do we make sense of who we are and what we're doing and how, how are we different from animals? Are we different? What do we want to be like? So, every animal has got a set of qualities because I'm, the thing about human beings is that we think we can change what we're like. Well, a, a cat doesn't very often do dog. You know, a seagull doesn't suddenly start doing eagle. You know, a, a herring doesn't start doing shark. It's, it's not, it's set. Occasionally you get something weird happening like, you know, a chicken's born into a load of ducks and it thinks it's a duck or vice versa or that kind of stuff. But it's only really when something slightly weird happens like that that animals get a bit confused. Otherwise they're really like, it's a set programme. So there's something I think to be learned from that that... We, we, can, we can draw on it as a lesson. So if I, if I want to feel, um, like if I'm feeling nervous and I want to feel more brave, I can call upon that lion part of myself that I have thought about for quite a long time now. Now, does, it, I, does that mean anything? I don't really know. It doesn't really matter to me. I just think if I feel like um, I want to feel brave or stalking, like, that's what predators are good at, stalking. So if you want a job, or uh, people think of stalking these days as kind of somebody you fancy online, but I think there's lots of things in life that you can stalk a great job, or you can stalk... Um, bringing out best qualities in a team. There's things that you can kind of go, oh, I want to create that, I don't really know how to do it. Well, I've got to start by being patient, watch what's going on, maybe kind of make myself invisible. Animals are very good at making themselves invisible. Pretty much every animal on the planet knows how to be invisible and visible, and they can choose. So like, because I was a punk, like I, and a goth, and I was into all that dressing up and making myself very visible. It took me quite a long time to learn how to stop being visible and be invisible, like a deer. You know, like a deer's um, trapped in the headlights is a classic example of nature 
unfortunately not catching up with where we're at now because the deer freezes because that's that works in the forest if it thinks it's in danger it just stops and blends into the background doesn't work too well in front of a juggernaut on the motorway unfortunately but as a survival technique that probably worked for thousands and thousands of years it's a bit trickier now things move around and nature doesn't evolve quick enough to catch up with we've only had cars and stuff around for less than 100 years so you know if we could fast forward time half a million years and look out the window we'd probably see a very different world because everything changes doesn't it it evolves but um i do think something in your project about what animals are actually like is very simple what we think they're like we start to put our we pers we personify their behavior like we do with babies as well actually i've noticed being a granddad is it's really difficult not to think there's an intention behind a behavior of a little baby but they don't have an intention to be annoying or i don't know that it's not there yet like an animal doesn't really have that intention it's just doing its thing but we always want to put something on it we want to we want to make sense of it and put our our morality on it and so i think there's a, what animals do which is very simple which we can learn a lot from but then we muddy the waters and then by the time you get into the media it a lot of it is just sensationalist nonsense really like the way that we see sharks isn't accurate a lot of animals that we see is dangerous they're not really like that and then so then we make this kind of good and bad thing that you get in so many fairy tales snakes are always bad aren't they you know, sharks are always dangerous but then I sent you that video last night um, about the lion hugging bloke. I mean, it's just amazing. Gets out of the car, uh, he's got a GoPro on his head, and these two lions are running towards him. And you just have that moment of like, oh dear, this is going to end in tears. And then they're just hugging. And it's like, we don't really, we, we, li we like to think we understand what's going on, but I think human beings have got very simplistic in the wrong way. And actually, we can learn from animal behaviour in the right way to be in balance. Or like a, a Native American guy, that, a video that I didn't send you was saying, when Columbus and that lot took over America from the Native Americans, you could drink the water out of every river in America. Because the Native Americans regarded it water as sacred. They were completely in balance with nature like the animals. And then look what we've done to it. You can't even drink the water coming out of the taps anymore. And that's only in a couple of hundred years. So, that's probably going off on one too much. That's all right. That's <coughs> but then in some um, films and stuff and like media representations, they are, they do actually relate to like mythology and like shamanic. Because like, if you think about Bambi, like Bambi's still like a fragile deer. Um, yeah, and then, but then in with like um, the film, have you seen Cats and Dogs? Don't think so. It's like the basically the dogs are like really loyal to the humans and like are trying to save them, and the cats are the ones trying to take over the world. Right. And um, but do you think maybe? This could be from like domestication because like we now make comparisons between dogs and cats and say the cats are like independent, they like don't care about us, dogs like do. I don't know if that's like maybe come from what we've been doing with animals. Uh, yeah, no, that's a good question. I don't really know the answer to that, except to say that if you again if you look at stories and our mythology, the story of the witch in society, they always have a cat. Why does a witch have a cat in those stories? You know, you, know, if, you can either go, well, witches don't exist anyway, so it doesn't really mean anything, or go, well, but, but why though? Why do these stories happen? Look at Halloween, what we've created with Halloween. I mean, Halloween 
is an American, in, a recent American invention put on top of a shamanic ceremony, which is called Samhain, which has been around for thousands of years. Halloween is a, a commercial bit of fluff and nonsense, really. And everything's become sexy now, isn't it? Sexy outfits and kind of weird horror film kind of strangeness which hasn't really got anything to do with anything, but it's meant to be the festival of the dead. It's meant to be the point of the year when the, the wall between the spirit world and the physical world is at its thinnest. So if you want to get in touch with a bereaved lost one, it's the time of the year where that partition between the physical world and the, and the non-material world is at its thinnest. So what's a cat got to do with that? Why, what's this thing about a woman on a broomstick flying around with a pointy hat on with the cat on the stick? I mean, there's a lot of stories, but usually they kind of come back to... I mean, it's kind of going off on one, but very briefly, the story behind the stick now is something to do with actually women who were practising witches had flying ointment, which was a hallucinogenic ointment that they'd made out of various different plants, which, without going into too much detail, kind of, they, they used to apply the ointment to a stick and then apply the ointment internally by riding the stick. And this whole story about females riding the stick in the air is actually a bit more literal than that do you get what I'm saying so then it's like oh that's interesting like now if that's the story behind the story that women were applying a, a, a hallucinogenic and then liter literally kind of tripping flying by doing it well, where does the cat fit into that well there's just there is we all know there's something about cats that they kind of always doing that what they're, what, what, what are they looking at? They're doing that thing where they're, they are plugged into something that we aren't. They've got senses beyond what well, we saw. I have dogs. Um, but there's something to be learned from the character of the cat's independence and companionship and the dog's dependence, companionship. I think that's the crucial difference is if you left the dog to its own devices, it probably wouldn't last that long because it doesn't really know what to do anymore. Whereas it would be a quite a rare cat that really wouldn't know how to sort itself out unless it's just been brought up in a house all its life. So why do we, why is it that a dog is a man's best friend? And notice that one as well. Dog is a man's best friend but which is a female and they've got a cat. So there's all sorts of stuff floating around, isn't there? I mean, I, I don't really know. That's kind of your job is to decide what you want to focus on and see if you can find out what the story behind the story is and, and then how that gets percolated into the media, into contemporary films. My guess is not very much to do with the original meanings of it. You know, or, or like the Philip Pullman books, the Dark Materials trilogy, where there's a whole world where everybody's spirit is on the outside of their body and it takes an animal form in, a, in the physical world. That's an interesting idea. like a massive upheaval even though like lions are shot and killed all the time and, um yeah basically so do you think this is like to do with maybe the political powers or like is that what's manipulated it because obviously we're devices of our own media kind of now and it's kind of difficult to put poli like politics to get involved so I don't know whether that's like, that's been manipulated in some way. Well, I think, I think we live in a very confusing world. I think we're very confused. I don't really think we know what we're doing. 
And I think when you get a story like Cecil the Lion, or the baby being washed up on the beach, the immigration story, it's like, well, the, ba the, the baby washed up on the beach story allegedly made David Cameron rethink his immigration policy, that picture. And, you know, that picture of the, the, you know, the dentist kind of looking so pleased with himself after killing Cecil the lion, which has got a name, interesting, the, the lion's got a name, which apparently it had in the first place. So that's when you, that's when you begin to see there's a story. It isn't a, a person somewhere killed a lion, it's a dentist who's, who's very well off running his dentistry practice who's killed this lion that's got a name. We know its name because it's been tracked as part of some kind of ongoing research and the lion was kept on a reserve and he paid some people to take it out of the reserve so that he could legally shoot it. So he did a dodgy deal and obviously they didn't have any money so they're like, why would we care? He's chucking money around so we'll have it. We'll get and then he, you know, he, shot the lion and he didn't kill it and it took two days to track it and then you know so it's an unpleasant story and it's kind of it annoys most people because it's like well is that what you do with privilege i think that's why it's an annoying story it's like i think if somebody went into the jungle and kind of stalked the lion themselves with the spear and kind of trapped it down and did it all on their own it'd be like well that is pointless and a bit horrible but kind of brave and at least you tr at least you kind of did it on its own terms but buying it off with money and getting it chased out and shooting it with a gun and it's like you, you know it's just i don't think there's any sympathy for him as a character is he a bad, terrible, evil person? Well, I don't know. I don't think it's any more terrible and evil than shark fin soup trade, which has pretty much massacred two-thirds of the sharks in the ocean, where we fish them out, cut their fins off, and throw them back in to drown, to take their fin away and make it into soup that doesn't really even taste of anything because there's some myth about it having kind of various powers. I mean, that is an absolutely massive, wide-scale massacre of the shark population. Why isn't that a story? What, Cecil the Lion, it's like, it's got a name. So that's when you know that a narrative has been put on it. And, um, but it's a symbol, isn't it? It's a metaphor. It shows you that what we're doing as human beings with animals is really flippant and careless and I mean you know I'm, I know a lot of people are very vegetarian or very vegan who'd be like well yeah but hang on a second let's look at what's actually on your plate let's look at what's in the supermarkets and the way that we produce you know food on a massive scale is awful as well I mean the way we treat animals is generally awful as human beings and you know, if there was any justice in the world, which I'm sure there will be at some point, there'll come a time when we're not around anymore and we just had our day. Yeah. There's sort of similar to what I, I was going to say about like orcas, you know, um, that Free Willy at the time that was made, um, the fans of the film sort of protested and made them release Willy. And there was like a big thing about it, but they didn't really, like, they haven't really thought about <coughs> any other whales. It's like this whale that's been on TV, so everyone's sort of like, oh, we've got to save this whale. Like, yeah, what do you sort of think about that? Well, it's happened this week, hasn't it? I mean, that, when did Free Willy come out? It was ages ago, wasn't it? Was it like in the yeah. 90s or something? Yeah. Yeah, mid nineties or something. So Sea World, this this week, I think, have said it. 
we're not we're not using orcas anymore in shows that's it we're, we're closing it all down so if you see see if you see free willy as the start of something that was a kids film that was a sweet little film that that train of thought continued to blackfish which is relatively recent which really raised the bar on the whole thing which I didn't really like as a film actually but I kind of got where it was coming from and then in real life SeaWorld have finally gone right well we're not doing that anymore great I suppose but as you say, then the trouble with that is that is that just a token gesture of like, well, we're not doing that anymore because it's giving us bad publicity and at the end of the day, we're just a business and we want to bring people in to make money. Fine, if they're letting all the orcas go and they're not catching any more, what are they doing? Because they're SeaWorld. I mean, it's the same as a zoo, isn't it? Well, actually, it's not the same as a zoo. I mean, zoo is capturing animals and putting them in a cage. SeaWorld is capturing animals and making them perform and putting them in a cage or aquarium. So, you know, I, I suspect that human beings have used animals for entertainment as long as human beings have been around. But the trouble is now is that the scale of it is different. You know, we've had bear baiting and cockfighting and, you know, loads of, what you know, dogfighting. It's not a new thing that we've used animals in a cruel... Or, well, apparently, somebody said on, online last night that why is the lion the symbol of England? It's not an indigenous animal. And allegedly, the story is that lions were indigenous until the Romans came over here. And then the Romans were so fond of putting them into um, gladiator rings that we just wiped them out. And I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if it's true or not. But I, I suspect... That's what happened with a lot of animals, is we just, like the dodos, I mean, dead as a dodo. You know, we just ate them all. And that was it. So, I don't really know whether your project is heading down the road of conservation or where, it, where it's going. I think the interesting aspect about it is there's something about the relationship between human beings and animals that is represented in the media that is a quite a dis it feels like to me a distorted lens and that's kind of your research question is something about why why is is it that storytelling when it was in an oral tradition had the spirit of our relationship in more balance and like the media does with everything it's like pornography you know, that is not sex. We've created a world where the most commonly moved around stuff on the internet is pornography. And it's meant to be about sex. And yet we know that that representation of what people do with each other in that world has got very little to do with what people really do with each other in the real world, except that now it has. Because people have been brought up thinking that that's what they're meant to do. And that's become a problem. So I think that's the, that's the thing with animals in the media. It's the same as sex. It's like we just turn everything up. We just amplify everything and make it silly, exaggerated, bigger, sexier, scarier because we've become desensitised. You know, it's like what we're used to seeing now on the telly is like, God, I mean, you, 50 years ago, you couldn't have imagined having seen those images you can see dead bodies in wars on the telly and you, when you're eating your tea and all sorts of stuff that is just like, how did that become all right? I don't, I don't think it's all right. I don't really, I don't want most of those images in my head. This stereotype of killer whale, whales, like way long before, it was like 1977, there was a film made about orcas and um, it was like that they were out for vengeance and yeah I've seen it yeah mm -hmm. yeah and um, so and then that's like suddenly changed over time and they've like become like seen as more nicer and we respect them but like why then do we still think of sharks like is it because Jaws there hasn't been anything leading on from that or is it 
Yeah, I do think. I think so. Yeah, I, I've seen that Orca film. Um, you see again that 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 Orca. It's called Orca, isn't it? Um, that is another example of putting a personifying an animal. So in that film, it's about revenge. So we. We, we put a human emotion onto an animal's behaviour and turn the volume up and make it into a horror film. Which is fine. It's a form of entertainment. It's a horror film. But it's got nothing to do with nature or that animal. It's just a scary thing. Scary thought. And the same with Jaws. It's like... That film... I mean, I think Spiel, Spielberg, wasn't it, Jaws? Like, I think he's really apologised for that since, because he realised how much damage has been done to the shark population as a result of that story. Well, obviously, he didn't intend that when he made that film. It was just a good, scary film. Um, maybe that's your job. The orca thing is about putting human emotion of revenge onto an animal's behaviour, making it into an entertaining horror film. But it's got nothing to do with the animal or that behaviour. It's just a, a media thing of turning it up, amplifying it, and making something entertaining out of some some kind of resemblance to the truth. But that's it. But it definitely doesn't do the animals any favour. I mean, if you look at horror films that are like Nightmare on Elm Street or anything like that, where you make up a monster, the advantage of that genre of horror is you know it's not real. So then there's nothing, there's nothing to be scared of in everyday life. But when you... Even st that stupid, like, snakes on planes or any of those kind of things, it's like, yeah, the pr there is a problem with that for me, is that you make the representation of that animal which is an innocent animal that does do things that could affect us, but by and large doesn't. If you leave it, if you leave it alone, it doesn't at all. If you bother it, it does. Or if you happen to cross its path when it's hungry or scare it, but then that's really our behaviour that needs modifying, not theirs. They're just doing animal. Well, I think I think it is. I think your project is about media representations and how they distort reality. You know, we have a genre that we call reality TV. It's got nothing to do with reality whatsoever. We have a thing that we call pornography, which is allegedly about sex, which has got very little to do with what most people's everyday experience of sex is. We've got a thing that is just blown everything up, it's blown everything out of proportion, it's distorted and exaggerated and you know one side of the argument might be well it's only entertainment, it's not meant to be real and the other side of that argument is but the problem is that it's become real, that people do think that animals are like that, people do think that sex is like that you know, we live in a country where The Sun is the best-selling newspaper of the country. You know, the Sun reader mentality is not very thoughtful. You know, look at the Jeremy Corbyn story this week. He didn't bow deep enough at the, um, the war remembrance thing. Is The Sun's story. But he's been going to that f for decades. He knows those people. He stays there afterwards. He hangs out with them. The rest of them turn up for the photo shoot and piss off. So we we live in a time that the, the, the media really is very biased, very distorted, it has no interest in reality of the situation. It has an interest in selling copy, making profit, and ideologically controlling the population to behave in certain ways that suit it, as far as I'm concerned. How do animals fit into that? Well, same way everything else does, if it serves a purpose, 
to use a story to exaggerate something, to milk it in some way, like Cecil the Lion or something else. If Cecil the Lion being killed and becoming a viral story means that some awareness has been brought to that process of like, oh right, that's what rich people do. They buy this experience of feeling like a big macho hunter, but in reality they're paying people off to do something illegal and then riding around on a Land Rover shooting things. It's not really hunting, is it? I mean, it's just... It's, um, it's corrupt. You know, I think so. I think that's corrupt. But, but there's worse things going on in the world. I mean, that's the trouble also, is that so many stories cover up other stories. And that's what's happened historically, is if you look at what Christianity and a lot of the religions did is that they put themselves on top of what was there before. So like the shamanic thing that we've been kind of touching on a little bit, or paganism as we had in our country before Christianity, nearly every church in the country is put on a pagan site. Nearly every Christian worship day is put on top of a pagan worship day. It actually put itself on top of it, stamped it out, stamped the sites out, got rid of it. We've done that a lot in history. We stamp things out and we write another story over it. But then we've forgotten what the original point of the story was. So, for me, that's what's so great about the shamanic way of approaching animals. is like, you don't have to believe in the spiritual side of it at all to go... You know, if you want to know what it looks like to... be vigilant, then look at an owl, you know, it can do 360 vision, it can do macro close-up to telescopic zoom with its normal eyes, it can do all this stuff, it can hear amazingly, you know, it's like, we can't make media technology that can do that yet, you know, so that's what it is to be amazingly perceptive, I mean, they can spot a bloody mouse on the ground from like a mile up and hit it without it knowing. I mean, that's just incredible. All that kind of stuff's incredible. So, I think your project is about the distorting lens of the media in relation to human and animals relationships and the stories that we tell. And Now, if you can find an example of something that is like, oh, there we go, there's an example of how animals were seen 3,000 years ago and that has been brought through into today and put into a film that might be an entertaining story but it's actually maintained the natural essence of our relationship or the way that animal behaves then you might have a case study to go there we go that's what it looks like it's not snakes on planes it's not orca it's not jaws it's not those things but maybe it is the stuff that I sent you last night that's just user-generated content with somebody, for whatever reason, has had a GoPro stuck on their head at the right point and filmed something that's just like, wow, and then they've bunged it up online just as a share. You know, that's kind of like almost like the news is not the news anymore. We know it's a completely mediated narrative with an ideological agenda. Somebody on their mobile phone is in the middle of a riot and they film it and they bung it up on YouTube and it's like, ah, oh, there's the story that the news hasn't told. So, yeah, I think we live in interesting times. What are we going to do with it all? I don't know. We don't usually do anything very useful with what we've got, human beings, but who knows? Hope. Have you got anything else? Well, and I think, I think we have to learn from our own history a little bit and also recognise that it can change. I mean, that's where you're changing paradigms, which should be the title of this module, is changing paradigms or exploring them. You know, maybe that's your job, Lauren. Make a film about sharks that makes it entertaining and accessible that reframes what we think about sharks. That would be a good thing to do in your lifetime. Save a lot of sharks' lives by doing that. 
I don't know. I, I think we need stories, and I think we need accessible stories, and they need to be entertaining, and then the wisdom needs to be in the story. Like Harry Potter, I mean, there, there's an example. Harry Potter, or Mean Girls, have you seen Mean Girls? So, do you know the story behind the story of that? The story behind the story? Mm. So the woman who wrote Mean Girls wrote a book that got turned into the film. But the book is an anti-bullying book. It's about bullying. And so the, the woman who wrote it, I can't remember her name at the moment, she goes around America doing bullying workshops, how to deal with bullying and anti-bullying. You know, anti, anti and then that got turned into like classic kind of Hollywood teen chick flick kind of thing. But the story behind the story is really interesting because it's about bullying. And Harry Potter is a kind of, it's got all sorts in it, it's an anti-Nazi anti thing. It's about, you know, the, the, the Nazis wanted a pure blood race and they were willing to eliminate anybody that wasn't that. They were doing it. I mean, that's just the, you know, what are they called? The Muggles and the... Yeah, but what are they called, the ones who want the pure race? The Death Eaters. And the whole kind of like Voldemort thing is like pure blood race. Anybody who's mud, mud, blood, muddied blood, will just get rid of them. I mean, that is pretty kind of... You know, look what we've got going on with UKIP in this country, all that stuff. So that's when you begin to see the power of modern media is if you can make a story that appeals to all the family that carries information about death and bereavement and prejudice and brilliantly I think J.K. Rowling waited years after the last film was made and then announced that Dumbledore was gay as a character. Now that is genius to me. Because that, because if you'd read it or watched the whole thing knowing that, it would have changed how you'd have thought about him. But then for her to announce that afterwards and go, well, what difference does it make? No, it doesn't make any difference. Why should it make any difference? That's clever. I think she's really, really clever. She's far more clever in hindsight than I thought she was when I read the books and watched the films. So I think that's the trick. That's where it starts to show you, yeah, you can do something with contemporary popular media that really does change the way that people behave. Have people stopped bullying? Have people bullied less as a result of Mean Girls? I don't know. Have people had less tendencies to bully or be fascistic since watching Harry Potter? I don't know. I really don't know how you would track that. But I think, is the world a better place for somebody at least giving it a go? Yeah, it is. We'll see what you do with it all in ten years' time. Well, that'll give you something to add it.